Welcome to Doing the Work, the frontline stories of social change, where we bring you stories of real people working to address real issues. I am your host, Shimon Cohen. In this episode, I talk with John Paulson, who is an assistant professor of social work at the University of Southern Indiana in Evansville, Indiana. We discuss John's volunteer work where over the last two years, he's been teaching weekly mindfulness meditation to inmates in the substance abuse program at the Hopkins County Jail in Madison, Kentucky. John actually drives over an hour each way to volunteer at the jail. And I think you can really tell from the interview how dedicated he is about helping people through mindfulness-based practices. We talk about some of the challenges around developing a regular mindfulness-based practice in jail. John shares how he got into mindfulness-based practices and the integration between his personal mindfulness practice and the growing body of evidence-based research on the effectiveness of mindfulness meditation as an intervention. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Hey, John, thanks so much for coming on the podcast and spending your time here with us. Could you just start off by talking about this project you're currently working on? First, let me say thanks for this opportunity. It's an honor and a privilege to be a guest on your podcast. And thanks for the important work that you're doing using technology and using this medium of a podcast to highlight our profession and to educate people. So I value sharing this profession with you. Thanks, Sam. I'm really, really excited to connect with you. Yeah. So the project that I've been involved with for about the past two years now is that I live in Evansville, Indiana, which is in the very southwest corner of Indiana, right where Indiana meets up with Kentucky and Illinois. And so Kentucky is right across the river from us, very close. And so in Kentucky, Most of the county jails, since the county jails often serve as Department of Correction holding facilities, so they have people that are in there for local offenses, and they have people that are in there for longer periods, that they're being held in the county jail as opposed to being sent to a state prison. So they're there longer, and most of the county jails in Kentucky have in-house what are called substance abuse programs, or SAP is the initial, where participants, if they qualify, they have to have some charges related to substance use. You know, they have to meet certain criteria for their offenses, not, you know, falling into a criteria where they are, you know, uh, kind of uh, having problems with uh, like violence or things like that. But if they qualify, then while they're incarcerated is that they get to participate in this six month program where they're receiving some addiction treatment there in the jail. And if they successfully complete that treatment, then that reduces their sentence. And in that program, they have an established curriculum based on 12-step facilitation principles, cognitive behavior therapy, relapse prevention. And the counselors there are always trying to create some new opportunities. And that's where I got involved because when I go down there, I'm not employed as a therapist, but I'm a volunteer. Uh, But I go down because several years ago, some of the participants wanted some additional exposure to meditation and mindfulness practices. And that's something that I've been involved with personally and professionally for a number of years. And so one of the counselors reached out to a group here in Evansville that I'm associated with. The jail I go to is about an hour away south of where I live and asked if somebody would come down and talk, and I did, and it went great, and there was a core group of guys that wanted to work on those skills, and so I've been going down about once a week ever since um, to try to find a way to kind of add mindfulness-based intervention and skills into their already established substance abuse program. That's so interesting, and there's been, you know, such a recent push around mindfulness and the effectiveness of mindfulness and it's being incorporated in so many places but you know you've been doing this for two years now what kind of I guess response is there from the participants in the program and also what kind of outcomes are you looking at here you know are you tracking outcomes and you know looking at that as you do this program so I have been very impressed with and appreciative of the response from the participants Because already, you know, you're going into a very difficult situation because people are incarcerated and you're really bringing in 
these practices that often these people have never been exposed to, they've never seen before. It seems odd because you know not everybody is comfortable or familiar with like meditation-based approaches. So they're wondering, is this anything that really is going to be helpful? So a lot of natural maybe hesitancy and skepticism, but the guys who come and practice consistently are just having a wonderful response. I mean, just like with most interventions, you know, mindfulness-based practices take a while before you actually start to get more comfortable with them. You start to see the benefit. It's not a quick fix. Mm -hmm. And so that's good because a lot of the people in that program now have been doing this for months. And, you know, usually after several months, they can start to make comments like, I'm really noticing that I'm experiencing my frustrations and thoughts when they come up and I'm not having to react to them as quickly. That's a win. So the main outcomes that I'm seeing right now are in what the participants say. Since I'm in some ways sort of a community volunteer when I go down, mm-hmm. is that really not kind of tracking any specific outcomes. But I have been doing a beginning sort of pilot research project on this. I was able to get permission through my school. And what we're beginning to look at is just to see that as participants practice this over a series of weeks and months, are we able to show some changes in their mindful presence, the, their self-compassion, because that's sort of another part of the practice that we have to look at, and just their perspective on life. And so we're going to see if we can see if changes in those areas, and especially if we can see change in those areas related to the amount of participation, both in practice and a number of months. When you were talking about how it's a six-month program, right, and you're going once a week, so are they practicing with you once a week and then they're working on this? each day on their own? You know, what do they report back to you in terms of how often they're practicing? Well, and, you know, and that's the hope, but unfortunately, like the old country song says, but here in the real world, it's not that easy at all. You know, is that, so I try to get down once a week. Uh, Sometimes I'm not able to because of schedule and, uh, but there's another counselor that's there. And for these two years, he's been sitting in, he's interested in these practices And so I've been able to do like some training with him. And there are times when I don't go down that he'll still offer like that class. Something that's very neat about this particular class is that so the people who are participating in the substance abuse program. So if they successfully complete, they get a reduced sentence or like reduced time. I'm sorry, off their sentence. Mm -hmm. And they also have some other like smaller groups that they can do where they can also get some further time reductions. Uh, There's an anger management program that if they successfully complete, they get a time reduction. There's a MRT, the moral recognition therapy that if they qualify and complete, they get some time reduced. And my class is for to kind of use an academic term is an elective is that when people come is that they participate, but it doesn't necessarily earn them any additional time reduction. And unlike some of the other classes where maybe they meet for 10 weeks, 12 weeks, is that the way we built it was so that people could come and go whenever they are uh, uh, taking part in the SAP program. So as a quick side note, most of the mindfulness-based interventions are built around understandably, some very set curriculum, usually over the course of eight weeks, where each week a particular skill is being introduced. There's the expectation of practice and the expectation that those people will be there next week. That wasn't going to work with the jail dynamic. So that's another part of our research is that I've been offering this in much more of a open rolling basis, you know, is Mm -hmm. that The people can come if they want. They don't have to come if they want. They can come every week. They can come periodically, sporadic. And so that creates some challenges to teaching the practices. But it's also been good because it creates a sense of the people that are coming are the people that want to be there, you know, as opposed to just feeling compelled to. And so as far as practice is that, so they're encouraged to practice during the week. Um, Some of the guys try, and especially they say that some of the challenges they have are trying to practice back in the cell blocks where they're housed because it's very noisy and because some people can be very critical and not be very encouraging when you're sitting there trying to do this meditation practice. But yeah, I think for the most part is that the participants are trying to work on practices in between, between weeks, even though they're not required or assigned to. They're encouraged to, but they're not expected to. 
So take us into the actual facility and what it's like when you're in the room doing the meditation, you know, what's it, what's it look like in there? How many guys are in there? You know, what's, what's it feel like in there? Yeah. So, you know, at this jail, the substance abuse program has about 50 participants. I mean, that's their max. And so it'll vary a little bit between maybe 40 to 50. And out of those participants in SAP, usually anywhere from about 10 to 15 will come to mindfulness, sometimes a little less than 10, sometimes a little higher than 15, but not everyone in SAP participates in the mindfulness class. But everyone in SAP lives in a therapeutic community. So all the SAP participants are actually separate from the rest of the inmates at the jail. They live together. They actually have different outfits than the other prisoners to create this sense of community. So when I go down and then after I enter the facility is that they have a a library, which sort of serves as a classroom as well. And that's where we have the class. So there's some tables set up with chairs. And so then the the participants who want to come to the mindfulness class that day, you know, one of the uh, counselors will go and, and get them from their cell block and they'll come up. And then we usually have an arranged sort of square in that room so that everybody is sort of faced inwards instead of a traditional classroom look. And then we spend the time working on whatever mindfulness practices are the focus for that day, and then just checking in to see what's their experience like with the practices, and do they have any questions. And about how long is the actual practice time? Well, the the class, we usually go from about an hour to an hour and a half, just depending upon the day, how many people are there. And so out of that hour to an hour and a half, probably about anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes of it is spent in specific practices because we'll usually do a practice at the beginning of the class. And so then a newer one will be introduced and then we do that. And then we'll talk about where we're going, you know, from there. It's really cool. How did you get into this? Into the the jail program or mindfulness or both? I think both. Okay. I, I'm interested in both. And I'm thinking about people who are listening that are maybe already interested in mindfulness and they're wondering how they can help other people with it or people who are you know, wanting to learn more about how to get into it themselves. Yeah. So personally, I got into these practices before I did professionally is that I started studying about Asian philosophy when I was in high school and I started in a particular martial arts class. So that martial art class emphasized a less competition-based approach to training, more of what sometimes is called a traditional approach to training, which included an exposure to Asian philosophy of Taoism and Zen. And so I got interested there. That led me to another martial arts system that had a historical connection to a very particular branch of Japanese Buddhism. And so I started studying in that. And then over the years, personally, that's been one of my areas of focus is that so the way that the counselor at the jail found me is that I'm associated with a Buddhist group here in Evansville that's called Mindful Heart Buddha Sangha, and I help lead there. And in addition to that, I have a connection to a Zen Buddhist lineage called the Five Mountain Zen Order. And through that group is that I have an ordination as a priest and an apprentice teacher. So I have that part of my personal life where the practices come in. But the nice thing is, is that within our profession here over these past 20 years is that these mindfulness-based interventions have now been systematized, they have been researched, and we have a contemporary scientific secular rationale for their use. So regardless of where they came from, you know, even if it it comes from the Buddhist heritage is that we don't have to actually go to that. We can go to the techniques. And so that interests me because I was working with people in therapy and when I started to see mindfulness become more popular is that I thought, great, you know, this is wonderful. Early on before, before mindfulness was really established is that I was very hesitant to bring that into therapy. And I didn't because of our social work ethics of, not wanting to impose our preferences or our practices onto people. And so I was always extra conscious about that. Now I realize I was almost too cautious about it because now it's here in full force and it's nice to see the the two worlds come together. 
So as a quick example, my, uh, my Zen teacher is also a clinical psychologist who writes and teaches on how to integrate mindfulness and therapy. So it's very interesting that we can have this very traditional discussion about where these practices come from, from the Buddhist and Zen heritage, but then we can also talk about how they're adapted and presented to a contemporary, you know, therapeutic arrangement. So that's how I got into it personally was just through my martial arts training, my interest in life. And then professionally, since I already had that, I started to become very interested once this was becoming more accepted and more popular in our work. Right. And now there's an actual evidence base for that, which I'm sure makes you feel a lot better about incorporating it into the work you're doing. It does. And I think as a field, and so this has been a focus of some of my recent work and others, you know, there's a lot of people who have already written on this and done a great job. But I think now that it's been introduced and it's seen as, okay, acceptable. And then now not only acceptable, but there's an evidence base. The next thing for our profession of social work and clinical social work to focus on is how do we try to ensure competency using these approaches and how do we develop that? Because with such an interest, there's lots of people that very quickly want to use these approaches and there's a lot of great books and recordings and so that's a wonderful thing. But sometimes I think that therapists might rush to use these approaches too quickly without having a deeper understanding of what exactly are these skills and what are they targeting and how do I try to work with them from a very firsthand account? So one of the biggest parts about developing competency is as clinicians is that we need to have our own established practice if we're going to be using it with individuals in therapy. So I think that definitely in our field is progressing to the point of now is not only accepted, but we have a good support for it as far as the evidence. And now we have to try to make sure that we're continuing to do it well and that we're not rushing to do it too much too quick. And is that something that you're, you know, kind of working on also is is working on what competent, what might be considered competent? Yeah. And continuing to try to promote that, you know, through continuing education, you know, through classes and, you know, just trying to you know, make sure that just like with any approach, because it's not just mindfulness, you know, we want to make sure that we're good stewards of the techniques that we're trying to use with individuals so that we're not using them in a haphazard or piecemeal way so that there's a rationale so that there's a, a consistency that connects to the the individual's needs and preferences. Going back to the participants in the jail program, what are, you know, do you, do you know what are the primary substances that they're in there, you know, do they talk about what, why they're in that program? What led them to that program? Yeah, it's a great question. And actually just, I think like any program, it's pretty much every, everything and anything, you know, so a lot of people where it's been alcohol for other people, it's been uh, marijuana based offenses or uh, opioids. Uh, Methamphetamine is still uh, very prevalent in our area. So that's another common one. And so usually people have had some type of a, of a combination of this. So I think that a wide variety of, of substance use and substance related charges bring them into the program. And do they, have they had to go through some sort of detox period before they can participate in the mindfulness class? Not necessarily. There's always going to be this period where, you know, people actually have to get, uh, admitted to the SAP program. And it is a program to where if people don't stay with it and follow the rules is that they can be removed from SAP, which means they're then just put back in general population. And that changes, that modifies their their sentence. So by the time that people have come into SAP, you know, where they've had to ask to sort of be in there, because that means usually they've already been incarcerated for a while, So by the time they get into the program, most people have a little bit of ground under them in respect to that. I think it would be fascinating to, you know, and I know you're doing this as a volunteer, of course, but to track the what happens when, you know, they leave jail and if they continue these practices, if it results in, you know, lower recidivism rates, if they report that they handle conflict differently, you know, some of those, or if this becomes a coping, you know, maybe some of what they were doing was self-medicating and this is, you know, now a coping 
strategy versus drinking or, or using drugs? Oh, definitely. That would be a, a very good area to look at because of some logistics, not in a position to look at it right now. Right. Now, one thing that we have looked at is when people are graduating from SAP and we're, I'm doing an exit interview and asking about their experience with working on these skills, you know, while in the program, while in jail, is that some of the things that people will say they notice as benefits is this sense of, well, it seems to help me with my anger that before I react as I would have, before I would say the things that would cause trouble or do the things that would cause trouble, I'm able to notice it and then not have to do that. And so some of the inmates even say that they notice that not only back in the cell, but when they're receiving visitations, you know, when they're getting news. And so like in addition to maybe just helping them to, a lot of people report that, you know, it kind of just helps them to feel kind of more relaxed, you know, more settled. But the other big thing that they report is that sense of really changing their reactivity to situations, both outside of them and inside of them. So whether it's strong emotions or difficult thoughts that come up and how they react to those, or if it's conflicts sort of in the, in the cell block, or if they're hearing news about what's happening in life outside, especially like their family and friends, and then that's a tough spot to be in where you can't quickly do something about it, is that they'll say at least it helps them to, to notice that and to respond to it more constructively than they would have otherwise. Yeah, I think it's fascinating. I, I mean, it's not an area that I've honestly read a whole lot about, although I I do some mindfulness myself and I've done some uh, recordings. I've played some recordings. The UCLA has a website with some free yeah. recordings. So I've actually played that sometimes at the start of class to kind of help students just focus, you know, before class, I, I'm, I, you know, I'm thinking about the population you're talking about and it seems that it could actually, maybe there's research being done on this and I have no idea, but it, could actually help them with their with the effectiveness of some of the other interventions like maybe it's easier to participate in CBT when you're able to observe thoughts better you know and, and because you've learned it through the mindfulness practice oh i agree i think that and that's one of those things where the mindfulness practices complement other interventions so it's not meant to be something that is standalone it's another tool in the toolbox so to speak and that's one of the challenges going back to the interesting to see if they continue to do it once they get out and i mean in addition to just not having contact with them once they leave another difficult spot that i try to navigate around is that so for an example in dealing with substance use is that when they leave they're going to be easily connected to recovery meetings and unfortunately, with the mindfulness-based practices, at least what I have found, is that, I mean, there's some good books, good recordings, you know, good resources, but when people ask about groups, there's very few, especially in our area, and the ones that they could, could find approach these practices from, from a, a, a Buddhist standpoint. So some people are okay with that, you know, some people not. So I think that's one of the challenges to helping people to find a sense of continued practice even once they leave a program. Now, as a side note, there is an addiction agency here in Evansville that I have the privilege of doing some clinical supervision for. And so these are people that are now out and are finishing up with some continued outpatient treatment. And they have two different mindfulness-based relapse prevention groups. So that's a particular protocol that was developed. And so that is one of the options in addition to other programming. So I think as a as a provider community, if these are going to be skills that we're going to continue to introduce, we're going to have to think a little bit further down the road to say, how can we help people to have some ongoing supports for this practice and to have that from more of a self-help or a therapeutic standpoint than making people feel that they have to go and pursue a, a spiritual or wisdom tradition that maybe they're not familiar with or comfortable with. Yeah, that's really interesting. You know, I, I think it would fit, I would think it fits well with 12 step if they're attending 12 step because there's a whole meditative part of the 12 steps and there's a lot of 12 step groups have meditation meetings. They do. And we have, we have, we have one here in Evansville, it's called a step 11 group, you know, because step 11 refers to encouraging prayer and meditation. And so that meets, and there's also a, a, a modified 12 step group that meets in the area that 
that includes 12 step principles and uh, yoga practices. So we've got, we have two groups that are starting to, to go that way, but I think that's going to be a key because, you know, when I go down to, you know, to the jail, I'm, I'm a, I'm an interesting volunteer because even though I'm a volunteer, I'm a clinical social worker by training and a clinical addiction counselor by training. So even though I'm not doing therapy, I can see what they're doing. And I know that therapeutic lens, but also, you know, even though I'm a Buddhist teacher is that when I go down, I'm not going in there in any type of a, a, a ministerial role, you know, is that, uh, and so like, if some of the guys have questions about aspects of Buddhism, then I answer them and I do my best. But when I'm doing the class, I really have focused on it more from a sense of that these are more kind of psychological coping skills based, you know, as opposed to religious or spiritual practice. Uh, there's a wonderful organization it's called the, the Prison Mindfulness Institute. And that's a suggestion that they've made is that there's usually one of two ways that these practices find themselves in, in coming into facilities, usually either from a religious context or usually more from a psychological self-help, self-improvement context. And that's the approach that we've taken here at the jail is that it's kind of combined with the addiction treatment as opposed to coming from a religious stance. How did that come about? Was that just a decision that was made or, you know, what led to, what led, to, I guess, to that decision? One of the factors that affected that decision was just trying to be cognizant of and sensitive to the surrounding community. So, I mean, I would have to say this never came up in any type of conversation about starting the class, but the counselors and I were still very conscious is that we live in an area that uh, is not always accepting and supporting, supportive of these type of, of practices. And so the thought of coming at it from more of a, like a religious or, or Buddhist view is that there was a thought of, well, that might create some resistance, you know, maybe even at the level of administration to sort of be hesitant to add that. So since there was already an established substance abuse program where they're doing treatment, and since I have that background where I can understand the clinical work and I understand how these practices are used in a clinical context where they're being presented from a non-Buddhist perspective. We decided that this just really fits along with the treatment that they're doing because what they have to do needs to be evidence-based as well. And I was able to show the the, the, the evidence supporting mindfulness-based relapse prevention, some of the adaptations of acceptance and commitment therapy that are used to target substance use, so that that way it helped, I think, to add some comfort and confidence to adding this class so that it didn't seem like it was something that was so different from what they were already doing. It's just another aspect of the treatment. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. You know, you're, you're, you're busy, obviously, with your your regular job and all the other things you're doing, what keeps you driving? I think you said it's an hour for you to get there. So then it's an hour for you to get back, obviously. And what keeps you doing this? You've been doing this for once a week for two years. You know, what keeps you going with this volunteer project? Because it's important and they're important. It really is very fulfilling and encouraging when I go and I get this positive reception. You know, that the, the people that are coming to participate, now I'm under no illusion that maybe they're going to continue to do this for a long time or, you know, that, that they're extremely committed to this practice. But most of the people that are there are, and they really appreciate the opportunity to pursue activities that could help them in their sobriety and in their life. So I think that you know, here for the past year and a half, we've been trying to do this pilot study. We're just now trying to look at some of the, the data on that and, and see, you know, what that shows. But I think in general is that it's just a, a wonderful opportunity to be able to present some skills that I have a close connection to and that I feel very confident in personally and professionally to people that are trying to find new resources to help them change their life. And you know, it's one of those deals where I've just sort of found it nice is that, and so I've, I've had the good fortune of, of also kind of like leading these skills in our area 
for just kind of the, the general community and also I've had the chance to, to do some workshops for a cancer support community that we have in town. And so it's interesting that on one day in the morning, I was at the jail working with the participants in the program and at night facilitating the same practices with individuals that are navigating cancer. And so it's just amazing that there's this wide applicability and what you see is in all the settings, including the jail, is, you know, people that are, they're looking for opportunity. They're looking for opportunity to feel respected. And so I think that's one thing that I still sort of enjoy going in. And it's a unique thing since I don't have to be a counselor or, or a CEO is that I'm somebody that gets to show up and says, I really appreciate you being here, choosing to come out and practice this. And so I see them working with this and struggling with it and having success and just that feedback sort of keeps me going. Maybe that'll shift at some point, but, but for now, it is a, um, a wonderful part of, of my week to know that I'm going to go down and get a chance to sit in that room with those gentlemen for a while and take a look at our experiences and how we relate and respond to those and try to do so in a more skillful and productive way. I think it's great. And it it's so, I find it so fascinating. And when you approached me, you know, when we connected around this topic, um, I was just really looking forward to getting you on here to talk about it. Um, thank you again for spending time by coming on here. And, you know, thank you for doing the work in, your, in the community. Well, thank you for this opportunity to, to talk about this group. And again, thanks for what you're doing, contributing to our profession. Thank you for listening to Doing the Work, Frontline Stories of Social Change. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Please follow on Twitter and leave positive reviews on iTunes. If you're interested in being a guest or know someone who's doing great work, please get in touch. And thank you for doing real work to make this world a better place. Thank you.